Jesus declared, a time is coming and has now come when the true worshipers will worship in spirit and truth, for they are the kind of worshipers the Father seeks. God is spirit, and his worshipers must worship in spirit and truth. John 4, 23 and 24. What is worship, and what does it mean to worship in spirit and truth? Today's guest, an international worship leader and evangelist, will share about his passion to bring people into a deeper realm of God's glory through worship.
Well, we hope you enjoyed our music talent, one of my absolute favorites. And we welcome you to Everlasting Love and want to remind you that you are loved with an everlasting love. And if you need prayer or if you'd like us to connect you with a church in the area, we would love to connect with you. And just give us a call at 773-286-2171. We'd love to pray with you as well. And just a reminder that you can find us on YouTube at uh, Everlasting Love TV. Well, today we have the honor and privilege to uh, be with Damon Stewart of Damon Stewart Worship Ministries. So welcome to you. Thank you, Lisa, for having me here cold, today. On this cold, blistery day. Oh, it is cold. <laughs> it's good to, good to have you. Well, I'm excited to hear uh, more about what you do and what God has you doing through your ministry and this concept of people experiencing the deeper realm of God through your worship. But before we get to that, tell me a little bit about yourself, kind of your testimony. How did, what kind of home did you grow up? How did you come to faith? Tell us your story. Well, you know, I actually grew up in the South, so I uh, have wonderful parents who are pastors. And, uh, you know, but we grew up really in Assembly of God kind of atmosphere most of our life as kids. So I kind of remember those um, summer week revivals, you know, that lasted several days, sometimes even a week or two, and it'd be hot and wow. people fanning themselves. But, you know, God was moving in those times. And so as a kid, you kind of got to witness a little bit of the Holy Spirit, you know, touching people's lives and people getting healed. And, and in some ways, you know, God was kind of getting me ready for, you know, later in life what I would be doing and but after high school you know going into my early teens and early 20s uh, decided to not really pursue God and pursue my own desires mm -hmm. so I left home and went into the military and thought I'd just get away from God and all that stuff and just go find my own life mm -hmm. and um, but in the course of that uh, really was fulfilling the prodigal son story wow. you know just out doing my own thing and really got involved in alcohol and drugs and, you know, um, pornography, just, uh, you know, everything that the world had to offer, I was just eager to grab it up and run with it. Do you know what, for you, were you able to distinguish, maybe not at the time, but what, like what was missing that had you go in that direction? Was there anything that triggered that or was it just kind of the, uh, this young man wanting to go out and kind of conquer the world? I think it was just, you know, I wanted to be my own person, you yeah. know, I think when you kind of grow up in a, you know, as a preacher's kid, you know, you kind of have to live that persona. You have to be that perfect kid and, you know, always be at church, you know, it, even though that's not the right persona at all. It's just a, I think it's really a lie. Mm -hmm. You know, the enemy really sown into my mind and spirit as a young kid and teenager. So you think you have to get away from mom and dad mm -hmm. so you can just be your own man, so to speak. So you went out, you were your own man, and what happened? <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, God never stops pursuing you. Yeah. And that's the key, uh, no matter where you are in life. If He has had that contact with you, you've, you've had that relationship at some point in your life, He is almost 100% guaranteed still in love with you. Yeah. And so that's the one thing I, you know, as a person who's gone through all sides of it, I have to say that once I finally experienced the love of God myself, it changes you forever. Mm -hmm. And I had never really experienced the love of God. I just experienced the salvation prayer mm -hmm. and never really took it as a relationship. I just took it as a step of, okay, I just did this, now I'm okay, and hopefully I'll go to heaven. Right. You know? And I love what you say about that because it is that we enter into a living, active, life-giving relationship yeah. with Jesus. That's where it's at. So, so. What's the turnaround story? So how, how did you how did you meet God in a, a real way? Well, I mean, like the prodigal son and even like Jonah, you know, you have to hit rock bottom. And uh, I hit rock bottom. I started losing everything that was comfortable. I uh, lost those things that was meaningful to me. Uh, I even lost my car, got repossessed. Mm. Um, so I'm back at home living with parents again, you know, trying to figure out now what do I do with my life. And so I'm just a 21, 22 year old kid, you know, with black hair that's sticking up everywhere and, <laughs> you know, earrings. And the, I mean, I was totally into the whole punk movement thing. Wow. So I'm trying to I was, I, know, <laughs> I rebelled hard. <laughs> and hmm. so my uh, mom actually uh, worked at that time for a doctor who was the doctor who checked the miracles uh, at the Benny Hinn Crusades. Okay. 
and this is 9192. And so I never heard of Benny Hinn at this time, not being in that <laughs> circle sure. of uh, influence. And uh, so anyway, they, uh, they offered to take me to a crusade in Dallas, Texas. So I didn't want to go, I didn't even know what it was really. And so anyway, they said, well, how about if we just pay you to go? So I thought, well, okay, I'll go for that. Oh, gosh. So not knowing that God was setting me up. Right, right. Uh, and so anyway, after, the two, after being there for two days in the crusade, uh, because of the relationship with the doctors, uh, with my, wife, my mom working for them, uh, we got placed, believe it or not, front row center of the crusade the whole time. So I couldn't hide, I couldn't escape. I was right there in front of the platform. Mm -hmm. And um, last night of the service, I remember the worship was really just really affecting me, wow. you know? Mm -hmm. And um, the worship was just so anointed in that you could feel the presence of God everywhere, you know? And here I am just inside of me thinking, this is the last service, I'm gonna get out of here, I'm gonna get paid. <laughs> what time, what time yeah, is it? what time is it gonna be? <laughs> I wanna get out of here so fast. <laughs> But um, the Lord just really started banging on my heart. Mm -hmm. And he said, why are you running so hard? And I said, what do you mean? And he said, you know, I have a better life for you than what you have for yourself right now. Mm -hmm. And I never really heard the Lord talk to me that way before. It was kind of unsettling. And the worship just kept going and going and it was swelling. And you could just tell there was just something in the atmosphere. And then finally the Holy Spirit says, if you will give up what you're holding on to, I will give you a better life than you could ever imagine. Hmm. And I said, okay, Lord, I'll do this. I'll give my life to you, my heart to you, but on one condition. So here I'm making a deal with God. <laughs> like this guy, and he's like, okay, I'll hear you out. I know, I'll hear this out, <laughs> but he already knows, you know. Right. Hearing our great wisdom. Yeah. <laughs> so I said, God, I've seen other Christians who got saved but yet live a life of misery. Mm. Most of them are still addicted to the stuff that they went in with, and they're, no, they're not even set free, and they just don't seem happy. They don't seem to enjoy serving you. Mm. So I said, if I'm gonna give my life to you, I want everything I'm addicted to to be gone wow. instantly, or I'm not doing it. <laughs> so as soon as I, now I have my eyes closed during this whole time, so I'm just saying this to God. I say, okay, I'll give my heart to you, Lord, if you'll take all this stuff out of me. <clears throat> Excuse me. As soon as I said that, there was a hand on my forehead. I went falling back mm -hmm. onto the floor, and I was out for a while under the power of God. Wow. And when I got up, I mean, I was totally changed. I mean, all those desires for my cigarettes and for my drinking mm -hmm. and instantly was gone. Wow. So God really did a miraculous thing that night. The real benefit of the whole thing tonight was six months later I had to have a checkup and what I had picked up in the Air Force because of my lifestyle I had picked up hepatitis C hmm. uh, found out that I no longer had hepatitis C God wow. even healed me of that that night Wow so he did the whole package that's in one amazing. night that's enough to uh, wake you up <laughs> it was it was a, a wake-up call in the sense that he really loved me yeah wow so what happened after that well, there was, you know, it was a roller coaster ride there for a while because, uh, you know, as it really is a newborn Christian, the first year was fantastic. It's truly the honeymoon time. Mm -hmm. And God really did pour out a lot into me and had a lot of just revelation stuff that he would just speak to me about and just amazing encounters with the Lord. But I went ahead and decided to go to Old Roberts University uh, and try to get a degree in uh, telecommunications, actually, TV and film. Mm -hmm. And it was there that I kind of slid back away from the Lord for a little while. So I got so caught up in the busyness of school and life, and so my relationship with the Lord began to suffer. But I did have the blessing of meeting my wife in Tulsa, Oklahoma, while she went to Oral Roberts University. Wow. So um, God brought us together. And then before we know it, we were moving to Chicago, you know, because of her job situation. And it was at that time God really began to speak to me again. He said, Damon, I really called you to do something. Mm. And so I really, in a sense, had to get right back with the Lord again and just, okay, Lord, I've been, I put you off and now I need to get back. And, mm. and once I did, it was like things just began to move and worship began to be put into my lap. And, and he's like, I've called you to this. Right. Because all through my years of growing up in you know, school, 
you know, I've been taking piano lessons. I was in band, uh, show choir, and all these musical things throughout the years. And the Lord really began to speak to me. He said, I was preparing you all those years for what I'm about to call you to do now. Mm -hmm. He is faithful for sure. What would you say to people who are, are resonating with what you're saying and, and maybe they have been near to God and they feel like they're far from Him? What would you, what would you say to them? Well, I would say He's so ever close. That's yeah. the thing. You know, even when I wasn't pursuing Him, like I said, He's amazingly always pursuing us. And it's just sometimes we need to take time to just, God, are you there? You know, if you're there, I need you to speak to me right now. Yeah. And you know what? He usually does. I've never had a problem of him speaking to me when I need him to speak to me. Yeah. It's, you know, that's the thing. You know, it, you could be living a lifestyle that's not righteous. Sure. Or a lifestyle that is righteous. Either way, he wants to speak to you. Mm-hmm. Yeah. We we need to listen and, <coughs> and then respond. Sometimes we don't want the answer. Right. <laughs> so you were musically inclined at a young age and God had been preparing you all this time and we fast forward a little bit yep. to the the ministry that you are in now tell us a little bit about your ministry well I would say probably in 1995-96 um, in the church we were at that time you know we got into a small group and then just for some reason the Lord said I want you to kind of do a little bit of a worship every time you do s your small group meetings but at that time, I had no instruments. I w in fact, I hadn't even picked up a piano in several years. I wasn't even playing at that time. Mm -hmm. And uh, so I was picking out songs from worship CDs, and I would put it like a little mix together, and we would worship with that, and I would lead it. Mm -hmm. And so that's kind of how it went for the about, I don't know, probably for about two years. And then the Lord finally directed me to a small little church uh, in, the air, uh, in the suburbs here, and I don't know, there's probably 20 people. <laughs> Wow, that's small. You know, mm -hmm. but uh, I had tried to get on where we were previously. You know, it was, you know, a thousand member congregation, a large worship team, several teams, mm -hmm. you know, very well established. And, and even though I tried to get on, you know, as a worship team member there, God just kept shutting that down, mm -hmm. not even as a support or a help. Wow. But when he moved us to this small little church, they said, this is where I'm going to groom you because you're hidden, mm -hmm. and I'm going to mold you and make you the way I want you to be, not what they want you to be. Wow. And so what was that molding process like for you? Uh, the molding process, uh, <laughs> you know, I have to say, reading about David is, you know, obviously one of my favorites, but um, I've learned to appreciate the hard times he went through, mm -hmm. because some of the greatest songs written is his times of discouragement. Yes. And when you're being groomed in the ministry, whether it's a worship leader or another position in life that God's called you to, there's always the grooming, you know. And you think because you're born again and you got the Holy Spirit and you're on fire, you got mm -hmm. the mission and the call, but God's like, no, I've got a lot of things I want to do in you first. Mm -hmm. And there's this one thing that God really spoke to me. He said, don't ever try to compare yourself to other ministers because even those who may be similar to you who may be even further out there as far as notoriety. He said sometimes many of them will start out strong, but they will not finish. And then the whole comparison thing, even God's Word talks about comparison. It does. I mean, comparison really is, is a sin, mm -hmm. and it creates fear. It does. And then Insecurity. causes us to shrink back, so, yeah. Yeah, and it causes you to get caught up in the, well, I should be just like them because yeah. I'm just as talented, when in essence God is saying, it's not about you. Right. It's about me. And I'm doing a new thing. I yeah. want to do something through you that's unique. And that's how he operates. And so sometimes people get uh, upset about that, and they'll quit the ministry altogether. Hmm. And because they don't like what God is wanting them to do. They want to do it their way. And we've, I've had instances where the possibility of going to a six-figure income to do the Christian music circuit has been proposed to me. And God has told me, every time no you can't do that wow which that's i can imagine I, to some degree it was enticing it's very enticing especially yeah. when you're married and you have children and mm -hmm. you got responsibilities a, mm -hmm. a secure income with secure touring cities right. every year is a comfortable position to have as a music artist or mm -hmm. a christian artist but god says i didn't call you to be a christian artist i called you to be a minister of the gospel worship is just one of the tools you're using to do that. 
So what does that look like? <laughs> <laughs> you know, I'm still trying to figure that one out <laughs> seven years later. But, um, you know, I asked the Lord that when I first stepped into this ministry full time. And I said, Lord, what am I, what is it I'm doing? Mm -hmm. And he just said, I'm calling you to be a worship evangelist. I said, but what is that? I never even heard of that. Yeah. And he said, just as an evangelist goes in and preaches the gospel so that people will come to my kingdom. He said, I'm calling you to do the same, but also to bring people into my presence through worship. Mm -hmm. He said, because in worship, more things happen than when you just preach the word only. He said, because my presence, God says, I inhabit the praises of my people. Right. He said, there will be many things that will take place just in worship that will set up for the word to be delivered appropriately and at the right time, and things will be done according to how I want to do it, not how you would like to do right. it. Right. <laughs> so he said, basically, you're just bringing people into my presence through worship. So what do you recall the first or one of the first times where you, I know you, know you have been in a smaller church and leading worship, which is awesome, but yeah. one of the first times that he called you to worship in this context and to evangelize? Into the ministry aspect? Yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. um, Wow, I have to think about that for a second. Uh, I have to say I was nervous <laughs> yeah, more than anything I can else. Imagine. Um, it was also in a very small gathering. It wasn't anything you know, big or glamorous or mm -hmm. anything of that nature. And I have to say most of the time I've been in, I've been fortunate to have been in the small, but I've also been in the large, you know, from a hundred to several thousand. Mm -hmm. So I've got to lead worship in all spectrums. The key to it is this, is that it's an audience of one. Yes, yeah. That's the bottom line. Mm -hmm. It's kind of cliche, but it's true. You know, you can't take somebody where you haven't been yourself. And that really, really goes for worship. And we can get so easily distracted too. I mean, Very with, so. you know, with the people that we're pleasing or, you know, the affirmation or the accolade or whatever the case is. That why, that's why, to your point, like having this audience of one, I don't know about you, but sometimes I find that hard. Mm -hmm. <laughs> but to keep focused, you know, on him. Uh, one thing I've always learned to do in worship was, um, I have to go back to the Benny Hinn crusade. <coughs> Excuse me. I was able to go about, it's probably about eight or nine more crusades over the next two or three years. And, and I think God did that for a reason. He said, I want, I want to teach you about uh, levels of worship. You know, how it starts and how it grows and how it gets to a point where my anointing and presence comes in. Hmm. And it's not something that you can learn just by right taking notes. It's just something you've got to learn how to see and hear and discern in the spirit. Got it, yeah. And, uh, and that takes time. And that takes time being with the Lord on a daily basis. Mm -hmm. You know, something we kind of talked about earlier was, you know, prayer and fasting becomes your friend hmm. very quickly. Mm -hmm. um, if you're going to really do this for, for the Lord. Because you don't have enough talent. You don't have enough strength. You don't have enough wisdom to pull any of this stuff off. Right. God is the only one who can do it. He's the only one who can save people, heal people, mm. touch people, deliver them. And unless you're in that intimate place with them regularly, you know, it's just a performance. Yeah, the, the idea of submitting and fully surrendering to what He wants to do so we can get out of, get out of the way. Yeah. Wow. So worship, <coughs> evangelism, deeper realm of God through worship. What, what does that mean? Deeper realm of God, like what, help us to understand that a little bit more. Well, I always look at worship as this way, you know, you can walk into a church and um, let's say on a Sunday morning, uh -huh. and usually within the, by the first two songs, I can get a feel of where, how deep the worship is gonna go. Mm -hmm. I don't mean that in any positive, negative way, it's just that discernment kind of kicks in for me. And a lot of times people come up on Sunday morning and it takes at least two songs before you even get their attention. Yeah. Because they've come in Sunday morning, you know, kids dragging them in, trying to get all this stuff maybe settled. Maybe they've gotten a fight, or maybe yeah, who, which, who knows, right? Yeah, you know, right? how that yeah. can go. So, but there's too many places I go to now, by the third song, the worship's already done. Hmm. And they're breaking for, you know, uh, announcements, and and you've cheated the people right. from spending time in His presence, you know, for God can really come in and begin to speak to, speak to hearts. Now, I'm not saying you'd have to do more than three songs, but I think by the by the sense of another church you go into and they may spend 45 minutes to an hour. Mm. And I've been in those services and a lot of times when the pastor's also discerning, 
he'll also start to move in a different way than what he had planned originally. Hmm. And sometimes I've seen where pastors said, I'm not even going to preach today because God's wanting to do something else. Wow. But you know what? If you hadn't spent time in that worship to wait for his presence to come in, you wouldn't have known to do that. You know, mm -hmm. you just went on with what you had already planned out. And, you know, mm -hmm. so church is just more than just three songs and a bulletin and blah, blah, blah. We're all coming together to be what? In the presence of the Lord. Mm -hmm. That's my thought when we go to church. That's my desire when we go to church. Right. I'd rather be with God <laughs> than a good message about, you know, how I can live better and all this other stuff. You know, we know that. Mm -hmm. But when you've been in the presence of the Lord, you know, God does something in you that's life changing. Mm -hmm. I always tell people that a moment or an experience or encounter with God, you'll always remember. Messages are a dime a dozen, you know, and I'm not discounting the message. You've got to have the Word of God. But how many messages can you remember on one hand mm -hmm. over a lifetime? Mm -hmm. But I can remember every encounter with God wow. because they're so, they're so precious. They're so amazing, mm -hmm. you know, because you met with the Lord, you know. Right. So how does one ready themselves to experience God in that way? Well, we say, you know, worship, you know, I don't even say this. A lot of uh, famous worship leaders have said this. Worship is a lifestyle. Yeah. And I know it's harder for some people than others to make that a lifestyle because not everybody's into listening to worship music 24 hours a day. And I would be lying if I said, I listen to worship music 24 hours a day. I don't. <laughs> but worship is part of my lifestyle in the daily sense is that I do spend some time with the Lord in worship during the day. And when you say worship, worship has many you know, facets to it. But you, when you say worship, you're, you're mainly meaning from a music perspective, like ushering the... Well, yes and no. I mean, yeah. sometimes it's... Uh, I may just walk around the house while I'm cleaning and just pray. Yeah. Okay. And then maybe just sing a song hmm. just out of my own heart. Mm -hmm. Sometimes it is putting on that CD, right. you know, of my favorite worship songs that I have on a compilation, you know. Mm -hmm. And I may spend 30, 40 minutes just worshiping the Lord. And then I'll pray for a while. Right. It's just kind of how I feel the Lord is leading that morning. I don't, And that's the fun thing about it. You know, it shouldn't be a religious, I got to do this and got to do that. You know, what is it that, you know, you want to express to God today? Yeah, a response. Yeah. Not, as you said, religious or kind of a ritualistic thing that leaves the heart. Right. I mean, out it's, of it. mm -hmm. <coughs> excuse me, it's one of those things where, um, you know, especially right now we're in this cold, frigid air, and, <laughs> you know, and let's face it, you don't want to really do much of anything, you know. Right. But, you know, January tends to be a very hard month for a lot of people, too. And uh, depression kind of comes in. We're locked in our houses. We can't do much outside. And, and so I've, I've gone through it myself, and I've talked to others who've had to deal with depression. And one of the key things I learned about coming out of those kinds of attacks or even those kinds of things that you may go through on a regular basis is worship. Mm -hmm. And sometimes just finding that one song or that one chorus, I found to be amazing in breaking that power of depression off of someone. Yeah. You know, it's amazing. And the power of worship has... It changes the atmosphere around you. I, you know, I've I've found that, and I sometimes I forget. It's so easy to turn on an awesome worship CD, yep. and there is just something about that that just speaks to the heart and puts me in just a more humbling place and ready to receive yes. what God has. So thank God for music. I know, right? right? Yeah, literally, you're <laughs> thank like, God. thank God for music. Yeah, thank you, David. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, the harp. Do you play the harp too? Or no, is it no, on your no. collection? There's a harp setting on the keyboard. But that's okay, about it. I know these days they have, <laughs> right. you can do it that way. Yeah. So um, t tell us a little bit more about your ministry. Like, what do you want people uh, to be aware of? Well, you know, I've been very, very blessed. You know, uh, God has really opened doors for me to travel, you know, different places all over the U.S. And as I said, you know, two different countries I've got to lead worship in now. And what, Australia? Australia and Israel. Yeah, not bad places to Not be. too bad, you know. Mm -hmm. I'm praying for Scotland and England this year. Oh, wow, well, good for you. <laughs> so, you know, you have to step out in faith. <laughs> That's you always got to step out in faith. Ask, you can ask. You do. Right, you'll receive. It may not be exactly what you thought, but it'll be better, right? right? But God... Here's the prayers of his people. Yes, you know? he does. Yeah. And especially when you send, sometimes he actually will put that in your heart too, to start mm -hmm. praying for the specific, because he has a reason for it, you know? Yeah. The door may be opening. So, you know, it's one of those things where God has really done some amazing things. 
and taken me places I never even thought I'd go to. And I always tell people who are in ministry, don't worry about where you have to go and why you have to go. If God says go, go. Yeah. So as far as the ministry is concerned, I just go where God sends me. Mm -hmm. You know what? And he continues to open doors. 